Hey folks, it's Jeremy Kirkland. You're listening to Blamo. How you doing? Ah, I'm, I'm sure you're you're all in uh you're all in full swing with the fall gear right now, huh? The fall vibes, whatever you want to call them. You're probably even uh, sick of pumpkin right now. I, I don't know, man. I think I, we we finally hit that part of fall where we're like, yeah, we, we we're there. We we got our coats, we got some fleeces, we got all that stuff, and you're kind of. <laughs> you're kind of tired of pumpkin. You know what I mean? It's like uh, I got pumpkin waffles at my house. I got pumpkin coffee creamer. Uh, I took my kids to the pumpkin patch. Jeez, man. I, I, whatever. Uh, look, I'm just trying my best. Just trying, trying to be the dad. Tr- trying, trying to do the things. You know? I'll say, uh, I, I will say we all abstain from that classic picture, you know, the family photo with hay in the background. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, we've all gotten them. We got different friends. I mean, sh- no hate. In fact, I I kind of love them, but uh, we didn't do it. I don't know. Should we have taken one? I don't know. Doesn't matter. So so much. So many more important things to talk about. Look, this is what you know. These are my good old fashioned intros where you just sit here and I'm just talking to the wall. But it doesn't matter because we got Guy Trebe on the pod this week. The Guy Trebe. Um, I mean, if I'm sure you all know who he is, Guy is an author. He's a reporter for the style section of the New York Times. But Guy has been writing about style and culture since the 1970s from the Village Voice, Interview Magazine, and to be honest, too many to name. I mean, just countless publications. But, um, for me, like Guy's takes and his reporting, you know, by the way, I'm sure he would maybe even wince at me saying takes, but I think he has a, an incredible insight on things. But, Guy's reporting has helped really uh, cultivate my love for New York and, and life itself. I mean, I, I truly mean that. Look, I know that, you know, people listen to the show and they're like, oh, Jeremy really loves the guests. But like Guy Trebe is, he's a big deal. He's an important person for me. And uh, his recently published memoir, Do Something, discusses his early life in the, you know, the up and coming art scene of the 1970s, uh, just right in New York, what was happening in the 70s New York. And it is... It's an extremely heartwarming and compassionate read. Um, you'll hear me talk about this. The audiobook, by the way, is fantastic for audiobook heads. But uh, I would highly encourage you all to pick it up. It's, it's just a good one. So Guy came on the pod. We discussed the current state of fashion, avoiding burnout, the brands he admires, how retail is evolving, and we unpack more of his recently published memoir, Do Something. All right, folks, here we go. I'm glad we got to do this, Guy. Thank you very, very much. Really super thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, well, I definitely want to make sure we get a lot of talk about your book because I've now, I've now read the book twice. I, I, I did the audio book, which was, which was very good. Um, how, how is that? I, I, you know, the thing is I haven't had the nerve to really listen to it. And Edo Ballerina is like a genius. Yeah. Um, it was great. It, what, what was funny is I think I, he did, he was one of the main um, narrators for um, what was it not not the gentleman in Moscow, but I think for the Lincoln Highway because basically after I finished yours on my like Audible thing, it popped up and it was the same. It was yeah, it was the same. Would you say Edo Ballerini? Edo Ballerini, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, he's fantastic. It, it's it's very done. Yeah, he's done everybody. Um, he he does Nausgaard. He does. He's. I mean, the the time, Susan Dominus did a piece in the Times in which he was called the voice of God. <laughs> Which scared me. it scared me because I thought it would be like Peter Coyote and the book would sound like a you know Discovery Channel. Yeah, but he has a very he has a like a beautiful timbre to his voice. So it was like I was lucky to get him. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was, but it was great. It was it's really good. And then and then I had to read it on my own to kind of go at my own pace on things and you know backtrack. When, uh, because there's a lot of stuff that you mentioned in the book, which caused me to go back to, I'm like, oh, did you mention that part? And, you know, then going back to a you standing in the house and stuff, but it's, it's a heavy book. And I think, you know, for most people, at least people that listen to this, they know you from your writing about men's fashion. But I think, you know, this memoir itself talking about, um, a time in New York that at least people now are trying to fantasize about and this world where artists can thrive and you kind of found your own way as an individual. I think it's, it's something that maybe feels like now more than ever people are really looking for. I I mean, I would hope so. 
I would hope so. I'd like to think that that would, re- I mean, obviously there's nothing about that period that isn't happening now. It's just that it's happening elsewhere. Yeah. You know, I feel, I feel like, I, the, you know, occasionally when I'm talking about the book or doing these book tour things, people want, you know, I, I, I there's this kind of desire to get in the hot tub time machine and say, oh, better then. And I, I've been pretty assiduous about avoiding that, you know, what I call it. A geezer gab. Yeah. I think it's just the. I think the locale has changed in a lot of ways. The the. I mean, whereas the book is about a city that formed me, um, the specific geography is really youth. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I I've you know felt very close to a lot of it. Like I I moved to New York when I was when I had just turned nineteen, and I oh, was, really yeah I I was on Norfolk and Delancey, and I remember the first night in my. Uh, uh, in my like apartment, I lived with this jazz musician named Bill Ware, who used to be uh, with uh, in a band called the Jazz Passengers with Deborah Harry of Blondie and Roy Nathanson, and we were right across the street from Tonic. And I remember the first night, he's like, "Oh, he's like, we got to go see a show." And he took me across the street from our apartment, and Yoko Ono was like reading poetry at Tonic, and it was like some of the most exciting <laughs> moments of my life because I was like. Oh my God, this is, this is New York. I'm like, everyone's doing stuff here. Everything is everything, you know, it felt like it was just happening and, and welcoming. And I was, you know, I was sleeping on a floor in a, you know, I, I got a mattress from Sleepy's that I hauled up a five floor walk up, but I feel like I was in it. And yeah, I mean, your, your book. That's the New York deliverable. And I, I mean, I think probably that has changed for real estate reasons, but, <laughs> uh, you know, and one of the things that I thought was kind of has been interesting to encounter, uh, is I knew this going in uh, that, you know, I'm basically describing the, the pre pre digital world. Mm-hmm. And so the pe- people's uh, lack of experience of having to do things in an analog way has been interesting for me, you know, cause I mean, obviously everybody's living in a screen and the, the period, that period, you know, the most notable thing about it is you had to go out. You had to yeah. go out whether, whether or not Yoko Ono was reading, you'd have to go out to find, find that. Yeah. Or even yeah. find out about it, see who was wheat pasting or who, who knew who knew how to get into what club yeah it's true i mean i remember waiting in line to go i think like miss shapes was was starting to to go at the time and it was at like luke and leroy's and and it was and for me i mean i was able to kind of i was underage but i had hair and i looked a little bit older at the time and it was when it was freeing and i wasn't even a person who was just going out doing crazy stuff I, i just wanted to be a part of something that i had always you know, uh, fantasized about in all, in all honesty, you know, from looking at Rolling Stone and Spin Magazine and just seeing live music and now seeing Mercury Lounge is like a five minute walk from where I was living. I mean, it was right. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. I mean, and a lot was happening. And I imagine a lot is, I mean, I'm not really doing that anymore, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'm with you on, in the sense of, of, uh, it feels like, you know, when you're walking around, because I, I don't live in New York anymore. I, I now commute there. I live in, in the Midwest. Um, we had to move during the pandemic. And, you know, cruising around New York, I still get this kind of like wonder, wonder-eyed, exciting feeling. But I am pacing and passing a lot of people who are in New York as well, and they have their just heads in their phones. And I get it, I guess. But, it, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, may- maybe all of you need to move away and, and realize you take this for granted because yeah, there's, there's so much stuff that you can just see by just looking up. I mean, I, I, it sounds so trite for me to, to, to go on about it, but it, yeah. <laughs> no, I feel that way. And I, I, I probably have written that far too many times, you know, it's, it's really, it's always a good instruction to look up and we've, yeah. you know, really speaking, I think that we're out of the habit of that. I, I don't exclude myself. I used to be very judgy about people on buses who were like looking in their phone instead of looking out the window at other people. Mm-hmm. I mean, now, of course, you have to kind of avoid people's size because there's a lot of very unwell people yeah. on subways and buses, far more than I can ever recall. Um, so, you know, for self, self-defensive reasons, you have to be a little bit cautious about that. But, you know, my, my entire working life was basically being a voyeur. And mm. I, I suppose some degree i am that now except the problem the i mean the biggest problem if I, if you want to call it a problem is that the you know the things that i find myself you know the the worlds or lives or whatever that i find myself tracking in my phone are are being delivered to me by an algorithm and so what i loved about new york then and and now but somewhat less now is this the serendipity things that i didn't know i liked already things that i couldn't have planned for mm. you know experiences that i would never ever have known that i wanted to have and maybe often didn't want to have but i you know you had to have them first yeah i mean do, do you do you feel like 
New York can still breed successful individuals in the sense of, or, or more successful artists? Yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely can and does. I just, you know, it, it, one, one thing that comes up a fair amount in the book is, and, it, and it, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I, I agree with you that in some senses, emotionally, it's a heavy book, but it's not a heavy read, I hope. No, it's not. And I think it's full of the, you know, the, the antic energy of New York and that, that I don't, you know, it'd be really, really misjudged if I were to say that, you know, that energy isn't here or that people aren't clubbing in interesting ways. And I know that a lot of, there was a time during the pandemic when I was supposed to do some story for the times about, you know, how there was no place for anybody to meet or do anything, but in these very renegade ways, kids were doing these kind of like drop a pin raves, like pull up a van and a lot and you know, drop a pin on Twitter. And then if you, if you saw it, you saw it and you, you know, you got there and, and you, ha- you went to that party. But what comes up a lot in the book is that New York in, in those days was in some sense a smaller population wise, not so much, but it was um, t- more tribal mm. and a lot of uh, inter- interactions uh, between the varied tribes. But there was also a lot of porosity, like you could move in and out of groups or tribes. And I, th- I think that it feels to me that the thing that would be inhibiting uh, is that lack of porosity. I think people are pretty much in, I don't know how I want to describe it, silos or kind of, I feel like they're in devices more than they are in public spaces where you're going to have to interact with people. Yeah. I mean, is there, what, what's your daily routine now these days in terms of how you're finding, you know, creativity in the city or inspiration in the city? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I can't say that that is really my, my, uh, my brief anymore, you know, yeah. and I think that the, 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 there have been some fairly big changes in, in journalism anyway. So a lot of people are really basically doing their reporting off their phones. They're not, you know, I'm, Pretty much, um, I, I, before I came to the Times, I didn't understand things like enterprise journalism and shoe leather reporting. I just thought that's what you did, you know. Mm. And that, now I realize that it was kind of a relic, even as I was as I was doing it, it was on its way out. So there's less and less of that. I mean, the, the almost the entire, um, you know, part of the book that's about my professional life uh, involved the, the, it involved me doing a job for the Village Voice that I can hardly believe looking back was a job that people <laughs> paid me. Money. Because my colleague Sylvia Plaghi and I would literally go out once a week at random, drive to a neighborhood, or we'd have a tip from somebody, but pretty rando, and and find a story. And I mean, the, the city never, never disappointed. Now, I can't imagine that that's different now. It's just that a lot of the the hardscape has changed. And I think uh, access to the things that we had access to, partly because people don't have the same relationship to journalism. And people are far, far warier of journalists than they were then. Yeah. But I mean, for you in the the career that you've created in journalism, it's interesting now. I mean, have you been aware of like how much your your cosign or or even just your coverage has lifted brands and and individuals? I mean, I'm very aware of that in the sense that the thing that I always look for, this is this is very interesting subject for me more generally and nothing to do with the book. Like when when I started at the Times, you know, I'd written about fashion throughout my journalistic career, but it wasn't I wasn't a dedicated journalist. Whose, whose subject matter that was. I was writing about it more as a kind of phenom mm. or the way that, the way that fashion existed in urban spaces or, you know, stuff like that. But I um, had the great, you know, luxury and I guess luck uh, starting off in this job of being around uh, the creation of what we now know to be super corporatized fashion. So when the, when the big, when the big multinationals like, you know, got the, the fashion memo and started buying up all these relatively defunct marks and then they had to go out and find the geniuses to run them so it was all creativity all the time like the lee mcqueens the you know margella he wasn't belonging to a conglomerate but galliano like really really you know unbridled creativity and that's always that's always the denominator for me like that's the thing that i'm always looking for and so i think now the example that i would most you know in at the moment point to is you know i was i've been i was writing about willie chavaria like early, early days when nobody knew who, who Willie was. And I'm very thrilled to see Willie elevated. Um, so that, but, but it was new. And I think that that's, that's what lights me up. You know, there, that, that sort of discovery, which was possible is, you know, Willie, Willie was in some sort of like off, off, off calendar show schedule. You had to really, 
you know, you really somebody had to have tipped you or you had to be turned on by what you were hearing. Or and I think that that has happened a fair amount. And you know, the, his 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 progression has been the arc definitely bent upward in a necessary, you know, like in a so sociologically necessary way, inevitable way. But I, mean, I can take a little bit of credit for having gone out and found it. Yeah, and I I think it's you know one of the things I really really love about your journalism that I don't think I understood until I read the book is you know it reading stuff that you would cover in the past it always felt like you were you know yes it was impartial yes it was good but it always felt like you were cheering people on and seeing that you've had so many various careers but were also like you know you you worked at brands you ran brands you you worked at clubs you had such a incredible variety of careers but all that were within the creative field it makes me feel um that you just have a lot of empathy for artists and individuals you know and with that being said like i'm you know do you think you wouldn't have had that had you not worked um on both sides of a brand before well i mean I, 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 you're you're very flattering but i don't think that i would go so far as to say that i worked for brands i mean i had some gigs and in my early days, I wanted to be an artist, so I was, you know, doing gig stuff uh, a lot and making stuff that we, a pal and I, sold to stores and um, just being around create creative people generally. But I think you know the the, the chronic empath thing is just my nature. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm I'm I think I, I'm sure that we share this. I think most people in this line of work do share this. It's like that, you know, the curiosity is a uh, non negotiable. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and I have, of course, empathy for anybody who's trying to make a go of it, but not if they're not talented. I mean, you know, it's like, God bless. But I, I, I'm really like to think that my antenna, antennae, I guess is how you say it, is are, are tuned to like real talent mm. or I, such, such as I see it, you know, because a lot of what we're being treated to now is mostly just marketing and, and corp stuff and corp speak. You know, I mean, I almost always feel uh, that what we're looking at, I think, in, in you know, in the, in the macro fashion sense, they're like market plays, you know, and then it, and everybody gets all tangled up with the, particularly of late, and since with all the musical chairs at the big houses, like, you know, it's personnel, it's just, it's the kind of, we wouldn't be interested in it if it was any other business. It would be just like somebody just took a job at Hewlett Packard or, you know, it would be like the back of the biz day. Yeah. Ages, but it, there's this obsession with these people as creative directors or creative whatever they are, but mostly there are people who are guiding market plays. Mm. And I'm, I'm I'm just much more sympathetic to you know the, the people who are irresistibly must make things. Yeah, I mean, I you know really am bummed that I never got to have any interactions with Helmut Lang, you know, but I admire everything that he has done and made in his career. But uh, a part of me, you know, scratches my head and it's like, well, wait, like, doesn't doesn't he need to be running his brand? Shouldn't he be doing this? You know, and I, I recognize that that's absurd of me to almost demand. But I think that's I've, I've almost been trained by, you know, this like high fashion consumerism of just expecting these creative directors to uh, just have their own factory and 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 always have their finger on the go button. You know, it's, it, uh, it's, it's challenging for me and I, I recognize it. <laughs> I mean, explain that further if you would, because I'm not a hundred percent sure I understand like what you are wanting. At. Sure. I, I, yeah, it's, it's fair. I mean, I think I was a little muddy there. I think one of the things that I love and wrestle with is, is wanting, uh, is, is I would almost have a zealous desire of consumerism of art and, Sometimes I realize that good art takes time. And in the world of fashion, into which there has to be a new collection all the time, um, I think some of these people can get burnt out. And oh, all, all, of them, all of them get burnt out. I mean, that, that's sort of what I'm saying. So in order to be, yeah. in order to get in one of those jobs and not crack, you have to be made of a particular kind of stuff. And that stuff typically is adapted to corporate environments. You know, the artist, artists, a lot of them have really stepped stepped away. The people who really are much more interested in the artisanal and the, and the artistic side of things. I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily like to use him as an example, but if you take an Evan Kenori, he was like, no, I don't need to scale. This is enough. I, yeah. I, want, I want to have what I do and do it the way that I want to do it. And I don't need to have like a thousand people reporting to me. And I don't need the VC guys coming in and telling me, you know, how to be me. And yeah. I'm, I mean, not that I'm valorizing, um, you know, that per se i mean I, I, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be the next you know ramley Bodie wanting to be the next big thing but 
you know, there, there, there's, something's going to be lost along the way, as there always is. And I and I have a lot of sympathy for people who just are inclined to, to be inside. He, someone who did this really super well was Italozzi Kelly when he was at Calvin. He did not lose himself, and he had lots of very big corporate jobs, and he was doing incredibly creative stuff, which everybody, including beloved Virgil Abloh, stole from. And you know, he he had a good go, and then ultimately was offloaded. But he he was able to keep keep hold of the artistic side of what he had in mind, you know, while understanding that the you know the mandate is to sell merch. Yeah, it's it's also really interesting to me because it feels like over the past ten years or so, there's such a you know an underdog mentality that people uh, have, and that they've a lot of it. It's because we've watched these young you know I'm going to air quote influencers on our phones turn into these like behemoths, these, these brands, these capital B brands and these designers and, you know, seeing how some of these other larger fashion houses have really tried to leverage the name of their designers in ways where it's like, I mean, I've even sat on meetings of companies that I've consulted for and they're like, yeah, we're, we look too big. How do we look smaller? How do we, how do we, you know, have people want to cheer us on and have sympathy for us when it's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're a $5 billion brand, you know? And so it's, it's always kind of weird seeing how some of these, you know, larger companies into which, you know, they may have a goal to have people refer to their creative director as a first name, you know, whether it's like a Hedy Slimane, you know, people. People are more into Hedy Slimane than they are the brands that he's been at, you know, and I right. think it, it's interesting watching that, but I don't know how long that'll last or, or you know, or if that is even good for society. I think it's more a matter of like what it is we're looking at. That's the thing. And I think that we're still imagining that we're looking at the great creators and what we're really looking at is from that phenomenal business people who understand personal branding and can leverage that inside of big corporations. You know, it's an interesting thing if you think about, you know, scale the way that you're talking about it. So like Valentino is like 1.5 billion, let's say in size, Yeah. you know, in, in the, in pure sphere terms, it it looks uh, the same, it gets the same kind of coverage. It looks the same as everything else, except that Gucci is like 50 billion, right? Like, and so, (laughs) so it's, it's really kind of mom and pop, relatively speaking. And so we can all uh, feel super excited about what Pier Paolo was doing and because it was felt incredibly creative. But the thing that I also try to keep in mind, I mean, this is a little inside baseball, but you know, how many of these brands are really selling apparel, actually selling apparel, whereas the apparel is the lost leader for the image and the, the designers are there to create that the image mostly. Yeah. I think eked out by the row and Phoebe Philo and her, you know, her vaunted drops and because, you know, they are people making stuff for people who want stuff that make them feel like good in stuff. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too. I mean, because you mentioned the row, I don't know who designs for the row. I don't know what the, the, you know, the row for me is like, it feels like they're always trying to project that it's the brand, you know, you're interacting with the brand versus some of these other companies, they lean less on their brand and more on their, you know, their creative director or, or, or the personality of the creative director that they're selling, you know, and I, I kind of wonder like, is there, is there a right way? Is it, is it, which way are we going to go? Because I, you know, of whether it's someone like an Alessandro Mikhail, like I, I feel like people are just going to kind of more lock into him and follow him or someone like a Hetty or someone like that. Yeah, for sure. That's what I mean by these people who are, you know, very brand identified and have a look and they're going to, they'll, they'll do that and do that and do that. I mean, Eddie is not really, I can't, it's sort of like there was a, I'm not going to name the name of this painter. There was a painter that had huge success, uh, 80s, 90s. And I have uh, other, other painters would always say of him, like, I don't understand how a grown person can keep painting the same painting, you know, and it's sort of like that, that a little bit, that's the problem with some of the people you're describing. Mm. And it's, it's that the evolution is what one is really looking for. And I, I mean, I am anyway. Yeah, no, I understand. Wait, 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 wait a second. I got to get my bids in on the bezel app, but more on that in, in a minute. I get all sorts of emails and questions from you all, which I love to read and respond. And one thing I constantly get and even read in the Blamo Slack is what watch should I buy and where should I get it? It's a wild world out there with all sorts of websites and shops, but I go to Bezel. Bezel is the trusted marketplace for buying and selling your next luxury watch with expert in-house authentication on every purchase. First off, folks, it's getbezel.com. That's getbezel.com. But I use and recommend Bezel because it's the best of both worlds. You can go to the site and browse a marketplace of luxury watches, over 16,000 of them, by the way, which is a lot. And I know that Bezel is going to authenticate your purchase. Or you can create an account and get connected with your own private client advisor called the concierge. 
Because look, making a watch purchase can be confusing, especially when you don't know all the reference numbers. When was this made? Did they use ceramic then? Is it a triple lop, dingle top? You know, what the heck? I don't even know. But they do at Bezel, and they're here to help. Concierge, baby. Look, if looking for your watch to mark a special occasion, or maybe you're just doing research, right? They even have their own journal where you can learn all the ins and outs about Bezel and the brands and all the stuff that's happening right now. But back to my bids. Yes, Bezel now has auctions, and not just any auctions. They got Rolex, they got Cartier, they got Audemars Piguet, all the big dogs, and more. So you can discover, bid, and know the Bezel team has got your back with verified in-house authentication. So visit getbezel.com on your smartphone or computer, Bezel, the trusted marketplace for buying or selling your next luxury watch. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm excited to hear Tom Ford kind of take a break and chill out. I mean, I know he's he's a dad. He's he's got he's got a, a life of, to live outside of him just constantly making things. I mean, I have no personal interaction with them ever, but he's a person. Yeah, that, yeah. It was, you know, you know, it's it's an age based thing, and he really wants to make movies, which is great. It's just, I think generally speaking, is according to what he said to me, the you know, movie making is the most sort of globally fulfilling thing for him and he should by all means do that but at the same time it's really wonderful to see in terms of very you know large scale businesses to see Hyder going there because Hyder is is really really a creative guy yeah and i mean and there has been a bit of an elevation of these like people i guess who could have been lumped into the journeyman category Mm -hmm. but i don't see them as such because Hyder is has been you know he's really i mean i don't usually like to use this word but he has elevated anything he's gone near i agree I think he also just, you know, it's it's always cool to me into which you have some designers where I feel like they really embody the personality of their designs. Um, and like Hyder, just seeing pictures of him, I'm always like, I need I need to change my wardrobe. I need to, you know, I'm just everything that he does, I'm always inspired by. So I, like just his own personal style. <laughs> I'm so good with you because when, I mean, I don't really, you know, I try not to get really too caught up in street style photography, but if I see a picture of Hyder, I'm like, I, I just, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. I am kind of curious about that. And I, I mean, like, how have you, because you've gotten to, you know, be around from uh, different eras and stuff and seeing things come and go. But I feel like, you know, you've always kind of maintained a very classic American style of who you are. And I am, you know, mildly curious, like, how have you been able to do that and not get so heavily influenced by all the trends? I think because it really wasn't my job to do that fair you know i mean it's really like i i'm not it, it is an interesting thing because a certain number of people who get into this get into it because they want to be you know cool kid and dress like cool kid and yeah the front row coolster but i you know i have i've always taken the journalism side of it much more seriously than the, the fashion side and so for me it was really just uh i think I, I basically dressed the same as i dressed when i was in high school i mean in high school that's not exactly right to say because i was I, you know hair down to my ass but <laughs> the basic american preppy you know thing has kind of carried me through i don't see a lot of it i don't have a lot of incentive to try to play around with it i don't really necessarily like to talk about age appropriate dressing but you know you have to you really have to keep it tight as you get older <laughs> sure sure do you enjoy shopping I, I don't even know what shopping is anymore it's a very upsetting thing to me because what i really really enjoy is is i don't want to say i'm a flaneur but i love walking and i love walking around in the city mm-hmm. and i'm really, really disappointed in my city in terms of what there is for me to look and look at look at in windows right i, I kind of jedi mind trick myself sometimes and you know I, I do i go in different neighborhoods to hope that i'm going to find something new and it happens uh-huh. um, but less and less and so i you know I, I i've said this before but you know when when manhattan for example where i where i live started to be only banks and 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 chain drug stores i i would you know as i say we like tricked myself into saying well this is a slightly more interesting Dwayne reed <laughs> they have a different merchandising in their window or something like that but I, so like in that sense of shopping like i would i would give anything to have things be in to some degree the way that they were where the real estate market could support lots of small scale retail and i i definitely think that there's an there's an appetite for it i mean i know there's atlantic avenue stores mm-hmm. here and and that's that's great but they're, they're i won't say they're one offs but they're they're fewer and far between than i would like yeah and it's it's interesting cuz hearing you say this and then also you know you have some 
folks that, uh, you know, like people my age or younger or whatever. And they're, they're saying like, oh man, New York retail is back. Like it's, it's, it's back. Like it, like it never left, but really they're just referring to, uh, you know, like event space and Colbo and CHCM and, you know, and I'm just like, oh, it's more of just brands that are run by like really smart buyers and good creative directors that aren't just carrying the same stuff you're seeing, you know, on, uh, I don't know, Mr. Porter or something, for example, like not that terribly different. I mean, and and God bless that. And I'm glad that there are people who are, are, you know, I mean, I would say that the art of the merchant is generally lost. Yeah. And that's getting built back in. I'm never going to be mad at that. You know, I'm, I'm all for anybody coming in and having well selected, you know, or, uh, you know, apparel. I mean, I, I'm for that and I would like more of it, definitely. But I also want, I want to find what I couldn't find other places. I want to find those small makers, you know, and you look around and there are very few really. And, there, and, and you know, as I say, not, not to be yesteryear about it, but there were so, so many of those things before. And, you know, like stores like Knob Carry, which was this amazing East Village store, it was hundreds of years ago, it seems now, you know, that absolutely was like a gathering place and the the most uh eccentric group of uh you know designers creators and also you know musicians whomever i mean you know the store as locus is a is a very appealing idea to me and i you know there aren't that many places that i can think well i want to go there just to, even in the way that we all of us i think used to you know whether you could afford it or not that was the beauty of department stores you you they were free yeah. i mean made them seriously yeah i know you're right yeah you, you literally but you could walk in and they had air conditioning. You could walk around, you could look at stuff you probably couldn't own. Um, but that's, I, I have found when I'm doing the book tour that I'm, I'm just describing so many things that now no longer exist that I have to just have to like to explain everything like it's <laughs> a department store was. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, my, uh, I, I didn't have very much money or come from much money, but my, my mom would always like to take like weeknights and we would go to the mall and just go look at stuff. And and we knew like that was the agenda, but we would go to like the, the nice, the like kind of more upscale mall and we'd walk around and we, you know, and it would be awesome because I got to see, you know, designer brands and I got to go to Neiman Marcus and, and things that were like where I was living at the time that that store wasn't there, you know? And I remember there was, um, there was a smaller kind of like high end menswear boutique. Uh, and I won't name the name because I think it's been, it's, it's uh, been resurged or whatever, but, um, but they carried like diesel jeans and I got to see firsthand, you know, this cool exotic Italian high end product. And, and it really got me excited for physical retail. And I think, you know, it's every time I go back to New York or, you know, go around Italy or Florence or Milan and just to kind of walk through some of these places, especially Tokyo. I mean, geez, that's the greatest on earth for me. Next level. We have to have a whole other episode for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'd love, I'd love your, your walking tour and shopping tour of Tokyo. I mean, <laughs> but you know, just seeing the art that's in physical retail, um, I, I like almost encourage every single person to just force themselves into because it's made me realize what a, a rut I've been in for, you know, my style and how I dress myself and how I want to feel because in a lot of ways that, yeah, like what you were saying, you know, to, to go back to the beginning where it's like, otherwise I'm just looking at my phone and I'm seeing a thing that I like, and then I'm getting served all the other brands that look like the brand that I just liked. And then I'm not really seeing something merchandised or displayed in a way that, you know, is, is challenging. And, yeah. And, I, uh, I yeah. Thing that I didn't already know I liked. I mean, that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that, I'm already bored with my own taste. Show me something that I didn't know. You know, and I mean, I, I uh, you know, I'm, also the dirty little secret about online is that so much of this stuff is crud and then you have to send it back. I mean, <sighs> the, the percentage of returns is like shocking in terms of uh, e-commerce. I mean, like really like a very, very high percentage. I mean, I'm, I'm saying what everybody knows, but it's, yeah. if, you really, if you really net it out, the difference between that and, you know, just getting out of your house, going to a place, touching this stuff. Because, you know, in the end, that's one of the beauties of being in Europe and why a lot of us who are privileged enough to have been in these European cities, it's, it's a joy to, to shop in those places. And there I do like to shop mm. because, you know, it is not, it's not an afterthought for those salespeople that they work there. Like it's a dignified profession. They're really into the products, generally speaking. And they're very happy to have customers and educate customers. And that's not really, that's not part of the, the program here, as far as I can make out, everybody's just like, yeah, whatever, buy it or don't buy it. You know, 
Yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, I mean, a lot of that also has to do with, I mean, I'll just go ahead and say just like the fact that a lot of the places in the countries that you mentioned, they have access to healthcare. <laughs> you know, I mean, I would work in a retail store forever if I didn't have to worry about healthcare. <laughs> No, I'm not, 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 I'm not, uh, absolutely, that's the case. Absolutely. <laughs> like, same, same with, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of things. I, I'm not getting into, like, the macro socioeconomics of it, but, I, no, for but sure. all those things being the case, they, there is, it's, it's not considered demeaning to sell clothes. Yeah. So, and consequently, you're in a much more equal relationship with people who are showing you clothes and, you know, explaining why you might like this and not that. I mean, it's the whole this and not that thing that I think is really, you know, it's, it's a luxury. Yeah. You know, you know, I am to kind of talk a little bit about your book. I am curious about, you know, your relationship to vintage things, because, you know, you had talked about in your book that the vintage stuff your friends had found and that you had found a lot of times like, you know, it was they had, you had said it was like more or less curbside trash. But I'm curious, like how your relationship has evolved with, you know, I'm air quoting the word vintage nowadays and. And if you have vintage clothes or even do vintage shopping. I'm very interested that you say this because I was, uh, I just did a piece about Bella Freud and I was talking to her mm. about this. So, I, you know, it, to, to split hairs, when, when I was a kid and we were thrift shopping and we didn't even call it thrifting, it's just we were thrift shopping and it was, it definitely had not been in, in, in industrialized as vintage, right? Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a market category. It was just, there were these stores that everybody scrounged around in and found like extraordinary things. And they were jobbers. I, I write about it in the book, this guy called Bogies, where everybody, everybody, all the, you know, like Blondie and Madonna and everybody went to this place where they were just un, unveiling rag bundles that could have any, you know, like old army surplus. It could have, you know, forties house dresses. It could have, you know, thirties evening gowns. It could be anything. And it's it, the, that part of what is now, as I say, industrialized as vintage, again, comes down to, you know, when you have like huge brands that are having like micro capsule vintage collections, mm-hmm. that is, it's kind of not working for me. Okay. But I, I, I have, you know, I, I love like Maurizio Donati when he went, who, who does Transnomatica and who was the creative, I can't remember his, his title of Levi's for years and is, is absolutely a genius. And he, you know, so he, he does this thing that's, uh, that fascinates me where he kind of, he, he's a great collector, but he's kind of, my, he has this vast, vast uh, warehouse in East Los Angeles in Vernon. And uh, he, there were periods even within the big labels where there was amazing stuff like early 90s Gap. And he collects early 90s Gap anoraks, you know? So it can like, there's a way even within major brands where you can see that was a period where they were, where their, their suppliers really wanted the business and they were making things really well. Or, or somebody, you know, somebody in the design team had some crazy thing going on. So like that totally appeals to me to sort of now, now, you know, if I get, have a nutty moment and start to go, you know, late night online shopping, it's stuff like that, that I'm looking for. Oh, nice. I have a friend who collects a lot of, um, you know, vintage men's magazines, not, not like, like porny men's magazines, just, you know, gent and what, what I forget the names of all of them. And I, I love to look the, I'm, what I don't love is the magazines kind of smell like mold. Don't <laughs> this is true. Yeah. <laughs> but what I really, really love is the ads because yeah. through the discovering all of these brands that I, you know, that are most of which are of course defunct and these labels. And, and so there's, you know, that I've upon occasion do look for. Yeah. So I had to block like eBay and Etsy and a few other things from my phone late at night. Cause I would, something would happen. I would be under the influence of something. And I'd wake up and realize I just spent a couple hundred dollars on like an apparel arts magazine and like, you know, a weird hoodie that was like from a specific era of Russell Athletic and stuff. But in a, it like I, I wrestle with my new shopping. I'm kind of air quoting that word because I feel like maybe I sound like an elitist prick, but like I don't, there's nothing new to me um, of that stuff. But of the older things and seeing how things were made a specific way, even, you know, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but that is the stuff that tends to excite me the most now is, you know, uh, an older version of a brand like you, you know, you mentioned Maurizio collecting like, you know, vintage Gap or vintage. I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, the amount of like younger folks that are trying to get into vintage Abercrombie right now, which I right. never thought I would say. <laughs> but it, it really, I, you know, I, I mean, I get I, oh, I, if it's for a moment, for like a crazy moment, I thought you were talking about like original Abercrombie. Yeah, like, oh no, yeah. <laughs> this is 90s Abercrombie. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, go for it, knock yourself out. But I, I really feel like, the, like to go back to the row, for example, I was talking, there's a person in the book, this this painter friend with whom I lived in the early days, 
when I was working at the Warhol factory and we, um, her, her dad, we, we were both on our own since a young age. I've been on my own since I was 17 and she more or less the same, but her dad ran a coat factory in the garment district. And we were talking about the days when there were such things and they were, they made private label, label goods for the department stores. Uh, her, her, comp- her dad's company happened to be called Paula Lawrence, but it never, the la- that label was never in anything. It was, you know, Bloomingdale's or what have you. And the, all those categories basically went out the window of like better dresses, better coats or the mid range stuff because then everything became designer. And you look, when I look at the row, it's basically they're kind of rebuilding that business. I mean, at vastly, vastly higher prices, but it's just good goods. Mm-hmm. I think when we're looking for like, you know, whether it's vintage Abercrombie or vintage, you know, 90s Gap Anoraks or hoodies or what have you, champion hoodies, it's really looking for that that quality without, you know, because I, I, I have problems with people who completely geek out on stitch count and, you know, whatever. It's you need five lifetimes to get that involved in clothing, but it, nevertheless, I you know I I I am, I am excited when things are very durably made. Yeah, and if you look at these, I mean, and durably not like I think it has to last, you know, millennia. But it, there's there's I remember I did an interview with Alessandro Michele, uh once, and I went to the headquarters, and I had uh, the Gucci headquarters, and I had been myself hunting for a, a an Aaron Fisherman sweater, to, and I wanted the old fashioned, like one that could stand up on its own, and that was really heavy and itchy, yeah. because I was, you know, this sounds elitist, but I was kind of cashmered out. I didn't really want anything of cashmere; I just wanted plain wools and durable I get stuff. It. <laughs> and I, he had on some hella beautiful um, sweater with pearls and whatever the hell else he was wearing. And I was like, wow, that's so great. I was sort of imagining that he was going to, uh, you know, there was going to be something Gucci was going to be bringing out. He was like, wow, that's just exactly the sweater I'm looking for. Where did you get it? Of course, eBay. So <laughs> it's, it's Why is somebody not just selling that? Yeah, I, and I think some of that stuff where it's just like, because they have to make so many, you know, I mean, and that's, that's the heartbreaking thing, you know, because you'd mentioned Evan Kenori. I mean, you know, yeah, if you're, if you're a brand that's that small and also have the ability to, you don't have a high head count in your company. You can make six pieces like Dana Lee Brown and a few of these other folks. Um, I think it's just tough because, you know, and now I'm going to sound like a broken record or something, but like there's a, uh, there's a price threshold that I'm sure you're aware of that. Like for some people, um, if X, you know, if a pant costs over $200, um, yeah. it, it's, it's not worth it, you know? And you're like, well, but you want, you know, fair trade, you want good quality fabrics, you want good quality materials, labor, et cetera. You, you can't, you can't make that unless some, somebody's paying that discount somewhere. And then people are like, yeah, but it's going to take a long time. I mean, I worked at a men's suiting store, uh, called the Armory, uh, that I, me and two other gentlemen had helped open in the U.S. and and um, you know that was always the biggest drawback for a lot of our uh, a lot of our clients was the stuff that they wanted to order was they had to wait for it and they're just like well can I just pay more to get it quicker and you were like right. what you know and I think that's the hardest and maybe worst thing that's happened with consumerism over the past you know few decades of people just want it cheaper and faster and when you have some of those brands that offer it at a decent enough quality uh yeah those those sweaters like you know the one that you were mentioning they're just no one's going to make them because it's just but, but a lot of this really i mean I, I hate to say this and sound like i'm you know about to start giving a marxist seminar or something but you know when you know after after deregulation happened and all of everything everything was outsourced or offshore, rather, you know, and American manufacturing shut down. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've had a million guests on talking about, you know, when denim died and all, you know, speaking of, of Japan, and you know, when I started having to go to Ueno Jeans Mart under the subway station in the Ueno station to buy, you know, like a, a good pair of jeans that I used to be able to just be able to get it, like, you know, the feed, the, you know, where, wherever you could get it, JBC Penny or something, like, it doesn't make any sense, you know. And so I, I would imagine that if they were in, if they were started to incentivize, ma- you know, American manufacturing, and it wasn't completely niche and boutique and Raleigh denim, God bless them for doing that. But you know, I, I, I don't want it to be fetishized. I just want it to be industrialized in the way that makes it available, without there being some like break your brain price point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, because I, I who was I talking to, and he was like, well, the biggest thing that 
we could do to change that. He's like, it'd probably take 25 years and we'd have to basically shift American culture into having higher respect for craftspeople and making that the thing versus the person who tells the craftspeople what to do. And I was like, whoa, I was like, he had nothing to say about fashion. It was just that like uh, society, American society doesn't respect crafts, craftspeople the way that say, you know, Japan does which, you know, a craftsperson's higher than a merchant. And no, and nobody does the way that Japan does, is, you know, that fetishization. But, you know, similarly, you know, I just wrote a piece about uh, Savya Sachi Mukherjee. And his business, you know, is scaling in a very large way internationally. And he, he, he had a, a 51% of his business was bought by Aditya Birla, who's trying to become like the LVMH of India. And the Savya Sachi's, Interestingly, you know, everybody makes, you know, all the Western, the exoticizing Western designers go to India and they, they, they you know, they make a toe touch and say, oh, we're employing the millions of craftsmen. And they, they trot out the like 15 ladies who do the embroidery. Never mind that embroidery is really done by men in India. And so it's seen as like this kind of virtue signaling, uh, you know, brand play. But Sabiasachi, contrarily, for reasons to do with his personal biographies from a middle class family in Kol- Kolkata, uh, is really about employing perhaps people at scale. And he has like a thousand people in his work rooms in, in Kolkata and, you know, and trying to build that back in without it being sort of fetishy, you know, I think, you know, I mean, he's making things that are for a slightly higher end market and they are specialized in a way, but I think that the basic, you know, weaving and sti- stitching and embroidering are, are all things that we industrially used to more or less had, whether it was, I don't mean like home did, but we had it. And I don't, I think, you know, if, if, if you're good, like, I came across the other day, an interview that I'd done with Eve Carcel when they were first, when, when he was still running LVM, LVMH and he was trying, or Vuitton that is, and he was trying to, they were trying to get into India and he was talking about 25 year plays, right? And I, and so now I've done this job for almost 25 years and I say, okay, you know, that's the timeline, that's the timeline, but let's, let's, let's focus on it. Like as a, as a form of uh, political initiative, uh, why not? Yeah. Why not build back? that part of the now lost American industrial economy. Yeah. I mean, there's people that have tried to do it too, but it's like eventually someone gets venture backed and they just, you know, the, the greed of, of an eight X return in an 18 month window just somehow starts to eclipse their, uh, <laughs> their production process. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, I, I know I'm being idealistic, but I don't see any harm in no. it. No, I, I think it's, to be honest, I think it's people like you that have, have created like such an incredible career and have, um, you know, and continue to do so can help like inspire, you know, these like young visioneers or vision, well, whatever we would want to say, uh, to, to think that way and to dream that way. Because I think a lot of times it just, it just gets lost or, you know, but I agree like, uh, India is where it feels like some of the best textile and menswear stuff. I mean, the amount of brands that I'm seeing that are start to go there and not just because it's, you know, it's a new Portugal in terms of labor and, and production quality, but just that there is really good, um, you know, artistic textile work and manufacturing work that can be done there. And you can, you can push, you can move the needle in a way that you can't so much in Italy anymore. Um, Figure, literally and figuratively. I mean, I don't mean to use all these puns here, <laughs> but yeah. But it is the case. And I think that, you know, be, be just being mindful, I think, and this is, a, this is an incredibly boring thing that I don't really write a lot about because, you know, it's for the lay reader, it's not of great interest. But consolidation is really, ha- you know, corporate consolidation has just generally not been a good thing. I mean, you know, we're all aware of like, you know, the issues with monopolistic practice. But when you find that the big corporations are not only, you know, kind of controlling the landscape, but also buying up all the mills, you know, all, all the all the mid-level mills so that they own all the sources of production. So that if you're somebody who, who, who you know, you're like a young designer and you have an order for 200 of something and the mill will work with you. And then one of these megas comes along and orders, you know, formerly could order 20,000, you know, you're, you're out of luck for starters mm-hmm. they're do business with you and now they're go- now they're just buying the mill <laughs> and they're going to yeah. be- no seriously it's a, it's 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 a, it's a corporate initiative across the board in that sector and so i think how do you how how are people going to do that unless like raleigh denim or something they just get their own looms yeah and i and i don't i don't see how that's you know i mean i do see how it's possible because he did it victor lipanenko did it but you know uh, it, uh, how you scale that i have no idea with, with or without vc money yeah i mean it's it's definitely a challenge but w- 
you know, with all that and the, you know, obviously the stuff that you've experienced and want to see happen, like, where do you get to find out or where do you go to find optimism now? Uh, I, I'm not sure what optimism would mean in this circumstance. I mean, I'm, I'm not pessimistic at all. I, I'm, you know, there's plenty of people making interesting stuff and they're finding a way. Also, the garment district is not completely dead. Just yeah. To speak, speak of New York itself, because, you know, when I when they, when I've been covering New York Men's Day in the past years, which is, you know, New York is, has has had a lot of issues supporting its its uh, designers reasons. I'm not exactly sure. But, you know, there are people who can, you know, find, source and make. Now, in the in the, you know, let's say glory days of the garment district, you could you could you could do soup to nuts in a garment in one building, you know, from pattern making to finishing. So that that would be there's maybe one building left where that's still the case. So that would be harder for a designer to do. But you look at an Aaron Potts and he's still making stuff mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in a, it's being super creative and, and making his mark. Uh, I mean, I'll be curious to see when they do this uh, Black Dandy show at the Met, how many of these young black designers really find some room in there. Yeah. Or are seen as part of that that uh, phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see. I mean, I'm 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 excited. Uh, you know, I'm about, about what can happen from that, but you know, I'm, I also, uh, there's a handful of, uh, young black designers that I know that would love some additional resources to kind of make their own craft from it. So I, uh, hopefully there, there can be some, some good programs and things that emerge from this or opportunities for those individuals for sure. We both do. We both do. But, when, but, but something that, that I think is the most exciting thing in prospect about that show for me is, and this, this just to loop everything back to the book is it yeah. has to be. Uh, the curator, whose name I cannot recall at the second, who's working with Andrew Bolton on the show, you know, talked about what it is to be from communities where, you know, whether you want to call them marginalized communities or, or however you want to characterize them. And that is very, very much the experience that I had uh, as a young man in New York, that that everybody was from some some way or another from some uh, marginal space. Right. Whether it's economically, racially gender wise and so culturally nobody belonged in the mainstream and beyond that account everybody scavenged mm. and everybody everybody improvised and it was i've used this before but i sort of think like well if the culture says to live in a storm drain which for many of us it did you're like you know i'm gonna pretty that storm drain up and people did and i think that that's that kind of improvisatory uh energy has has never not been there it's just sort of shining the light on it will be a very i think you know, uh, inspiriting thing for me. Yeah, I mean, it was was in the book when I thought about the various people that I knew that, who were patching together these lives that were completely improbable, and had a lot of them not died um, because of the AIDS pandemic, they would be here to tell the story. Now we're the beneficiaries of what of the things that they created, but they were really making stuff out of nothing. And and I think that that energy is it's 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 been eclipsed i think you know there's this presumption that you have to immediately become you know the head of a global multinational as a creative director you like go if you go from i'm making stuff in my room to or you know but i guess you can do that if you're a musician you can be billy eilish and then become billy eilish yeah yeah when you were when you were writing i mean you talked a lot about writing to heal and you know in in your book you know, this is no spoiler. I mean, you, you, you do kind of find yourself. Um, do you think you wouldn't have had that experience had you not been in a place like New York? Which part of the experience? I think just being a part of a young community of people that took a lot of risk, but also, you know, ha- had to, had to find their own support, maybe didn't have as much of a safety net as, as a different type of community. Yeah. It's funny. And I, 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 don't, I never like to come off as if I have a, a cheap chip on my shoulder. Cause I, you know, I grew up in an upper middle class family and things went South, but, and consequently I, I was on my own quite young, but you know, I think that the, the combination of the receptivity of the culture at that particular moment and the, you know, and just the, the ambition and, uh, energies of people being young made made for something that was really interesting and i think that there was there was just you know this cult this culture is always throwing out a lot mm-hmm. and i and i feel like it, it's you know maybe people were like recycling and upcycling before anybody knew what that was i mean in, in, you know intellectually and, and, and in other ways i mean you know physically but also intellectually and i think that that provided a lot for me mm-hmm. you know I'm just, even if you think about the bookstores that the used bookstores that because you know i didn't i, I barely, barely eked out of high school and I definitely didn't go to college. So, you know, my education was, uh, you know, basically assembled from a syllabus I put together myself, you know, buying 50 cent books off of used book cards. 
and it, it worked out. Yeah, yeah, you, you've done all right. <laughs> I mean, it, it worked out in terms of like putting together an education for yourself. And so I feel as if like, you know, I found that when I was in, I was in New Orleans giving a book talk last weekend and there were some, there were some kids in the audience and one of them was this young artist who was like struggling with wh whether he should like be an artist or be tracked, you know, go and get, go and get an MBA or, or like get a JD or something like that. And I think it's something so precious about not knowing where you're going. Mm. And the, 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 you know, the impetus to, to have a plan. I mean, as I, as I write in the book, like nobody I knew had like a five minute plan, let alone a five year plan. So I, 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 I wish, wish that for people, you know, I mean, yes, it's scary. Yes. It's a little bit tightrope walking, but you know, you can do it. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes me wonder as, you know, you and I have a, I won't go into all details, but you and I have had a, a few sort of shared um, levels of emotional trauma that might have happened to us at different stages early on in our life. And I think that there is a, um, there's a drive that tends to form around folks who are adjacent or near different levels of, of like an emotional trauma. And I think for some people, they can go one direction, which ends up hurting them down the road, mentally or physically. And you, you, it seemed like you went into yourself and found like a level of drive and a level of like, um, exploration and I, I think that's one thing that is, um, that's, that's something to celebrate. And I think it's, you know, it's unique to you, but it's unique to individuals who are, are able to find something to grasp onto, you know, especially without a safety net. And I, I'm, I'm being somewhat vague to, you know, not try to give away a lot of stuff, but also. But there's a know. lot that wouldn't be given away. And I mean, you're very kind to say that, but I don't think it's necessary. I think it's a thing that's been studied a lot in families that, mm -hmm. you know, the same, the same you know, same siblings have the same experience and one survives and one does not. There's, there, 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 you know, genetically, there are dispositions to resilience. And I was, a, you know, I was a very ambitious kid. I knew, I mean, I'm not exactly sure I knew what I wanted to be, but I knew that it was something, uh, you know, I was pretty determined. And I, and I had a lot of luck rolling my way, I'm not going to say otherwise. But the, I think that it's that... You know, I, I, it was when COVID rolled around, I, it was very challenging for me because here you have, you know, a, a huge number of deaths globally and people dying in these very frightening ways. And I, and I having experienced the AIDS epidemic in New York, where 100,000 people died just in New York alone by peak, peak, peak pandemic years. Um, you know, I was sort of like, wait, 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 I already did this. Mm. You know, and that and having that experience very young had to have been formative. And I think, you know, not I uniquely was was very much formed by that. Yes, in my family, there was a lot of, a tra you know, I, I think I call it a, like a parade of calamities in the book. And, you know, yeah, I think you can only write about this, this, this stuff with a or anyway, I don't know if you can only do it, but I, I was determined I was not going to write a misery memoir. That was not my interest. No. And I think that's that's. Probably the thing about it that stuck out the most to me is you could have easily turned that into uh, who's that that Norwegian writer who has like the nine books of my struggle yeah, and like yeah. Nelsgard, Nelsgard, right? <laughs> yeah, like Nelsgard, which you know he's a great writer. There's, I mean, you know, he's very Dickensian and in, in building his worlds and his situations. But like, uh, I, I I felt more inspired uh, and in ways, but I kind of questioned it as I was like, well, wait, am I? I was like, no, I was like, this book has a good ending because I also know how you've turned out, you know, I mean, throughout the stuff that you've gone through and, you know, uh, the levels of parenting you had to do with your parents, um, I think is is something that many people, unfortunately, get put into a situation to and to see your success from it. I think it's a very, very inspiring book from that. Oh, I mean, that's just nice thing to say the thing that I want to really, you know, not I mean, I'm super, super grateful and is super kind, but, you know. Everybody has stuff in their lives, right? And it's not a sweepstakes like somebody who has the worst life wins, but yeah. you know, or experiences. But I, but I, I, I have been fortunate in being able to. Well, I mean, I, you know, make something out of it, and I think I would hope for everybody that they have the opportunities that. And I really have had a lot of good luck roll my way. I, I can't say that that isn't a big part of it. Yes, I'm determined, and yes, we all want to try to keep it going. But luck plays a big role. And my, when we did, the, a colleague and I did this series called The Unstoppables, which was about people 75 to, you know, basically to eternity, uh, who are, who have made a lot of success in their lives and why they continue to want to do things in their late life. 
And almost everybody I talk to, almost everybody could be Robert Wilson. It could be, you know, Lauren Hutton. It was, you know, pretty, you know, Mark DeSuvero, Paula Cooper, very eminent people. Uh, They all were like, well, I didn't really, you know, I didn't want to be this thing that I became, but they all had in common these drives. And they all had, in many cases, they had similarly, you know, challenging, let's say, early lives. So I don't really feel like I I had more than anybody else. I just, I had what I had. And I had also was lucky enough to have the the resilience, I suppose, as a resource to, uh, to, I guess, survive it. Well, yeah. And I think for me, what it looked like you had is you chose to forgive people versus to hold a grudge for the rest of your life. And I think Thank there's... Because the one thing that I, people have said to me is that, you know, it's like a very compassionate book. And I'm and I'm very grateful to hear that said, because it's like, I have no, no, absolutely no stake in settling scores. And I really didn't want to, you know, do one of those books where all the stories come out to make me look good. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, but I, I think ultimately that's what happened. And I, I think that for me as you know, again, this, this hit a lot of personal notes for me. Uh, you know, I, I have a few friends who have experienced different levels and they chose to, to navigate forward, uh, and this sort of like Michael Jordan mentality of like, just anger was the drive and proving someone wrong was the drive. And it felt like you, you didn't really find your own sort of joy in your life until you started to let go of some of those things. And you realized by letting go and forgiving those people, you were able to look at the world in a totally different way. And I think like that to me was one of the biggest takeaways I took from it that, you know, I mean, I've always admired your work, but knowing that like this was some of the parts of your character that was shown was, was really, it it meant a lot to me. So yeah. And that means the world to me. And I thank you. Yeah. It was, thank you. It's, It's cool to see people who can not lean on their egos heavily for a career, but be in a world that is solely led by egos and still have a successful career. And so I'm just like, I, I just love you know, your take on a lot of these things. I mean, you should have a podcast, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, but um, it's it's a glass of water in the desert for sure. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Guy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, this was, this was really special to me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Blamo. Our show is produced by Blamo Media. We're edited by Amar Lowell and our theme music, as always, by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. If you like what you heard, you know the drill. Share the pod with a friend. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts, give us five stars or thumbs up on whatever other thing you're listening to us on, whether it's Dingledorp or Bing Bong, whatever it's called. But you can also follow us on Instagram for all the hot content. If you want to talk to us and give us your hot take, we'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at info at blamopod.com. Last but not least, super ultra important. If I had an air horn, I would press it right now. You got to come and join us over on Patreon. Because the fun never stops over there. Look, the, the, the live show, the, the, the free show, whatever you want to call this, we take breaks here and there. But Patreon, it never stops. And we also got exclusive shows like Die Workwear, hosted by Derek Guy and Peter Zatolo, and The Triple J Show, hosted by Yours Truly with uh, John Moy and Gene Deleon. There's, there's just a ton of stuff over there. So check it out at patreon.com forward slash blamo. If not, no worries. We got hundreds and hundreds of free episodes in the feed and uh, more to come. So we will see you all soon. 